So for any of you guys who saw yesterday's video, you might be wondering why I am not speaking different, and that's because I'm not going to be doing that until the re-debut. You'll see when we get there. But with that said, hello everybody! Welcome back to the channel, welcome back to another one of our weekly My Next Life as a Villainess X discussion videos, uh, where today we're going to be talking all about episode 2, I Turned Into a Villain, but before we get into the video proper, quick reminder if you haven't done so yet, to hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, set notifications to all, and let all of AnyTube know that you're here. And with all that said, let's go ahead and jump into this week's episode. And if I'm super honest, this week was insanely relatable. <laughs> this was a very nostalgic episode. I think maybe that just comes down to me growing up as a theater kid. Personally, I know uh, some of you guys uh, who watch these videos, I believe, are also theater kids. Uh, I've seen a few comments like that when we were last talking about Villainess. Um, and how it was sort of theatrical and like that had come up a few times. And when it comes to this particular episode, this is very relatable if you've ever been in any kind of amateur uh, musical or play. Uh, I feel like we've all been the person who goes up on stage and then completely forgets their lines. <laughs> um, that was insanely relatable. I can actually distinctly remember being up on stage once and completely forgetting what I was supposed to say and so I just sort of like turned to my my uh, co-star and just kind of flubbed the line. Like I was just like, uh, uh, we should make haste for the next train is about to depart. Uh, we can continue this conversation another time. Right, just sort of like completely dismissing uh, the entire scene because <laughs> I couldn't remember. And I think he caught on. He's like, oh no, there's still time yet, but we should discuss this thing. In fact, you know what? Let me read your mind, right? Like pretty much just we, we made our way through it as best we could. And I remember seemingly the audience not really noticing, but they probably, the it was like a children's play. So I assume the kids were just like, oh, fun. But all the teachers and parents are probably like, oh, they totally screwed it up, <laughs> which is fine because that's what happens here. And it's very relatable. Um, but uh, I would say too, another thing that maybe made me feel a bit nostalgic was that this also really reminded me of the stage play in Fruits Basket. Um, if you watched Fruits Basket, I believe this was in the second season. Yeah, this was second season, uh, not so much season three. This was in, I think, yeah, the tail end of season two of Fruits Basket when we got Cinderella-ish. And this does remind me of Cinderella-ish. In fact, it is sort of Cinderella-ish in and of itself. It is very much a reference to Cinderella. Cinderella, Cinderella, sorry. <laughs> But it is uh, a Cinderella-ish type story where we don't actually get any real form of magic, uh, which is a nice touch because in this world that wouldn't really be like a, having magic in a world where there's already magic doesn't really seem whimsical. In fact, it might even be more whimsical if all of this stuff happened without the need for magic. That actually seems more appropriate. And so that's what they do here. There is no magic in this particular version of Cinderella, which I believe they're calling Marianne. Marianne! And uh, I thought it was a really nice touch. Another good thing about this play that I thought was really, really clever was the fact that Katarina actually has to use her in-game knowledge in a way that she is not used to. That's something that we haven't actually seen from her yet, and I thought was really, really clever. I liked seeing her sort of thinking on her feet as best as she could, right? We we see the whole scene where she, you know, the the she tries to glue uh, some notes to a fan to try to help her, you know, worm her way out of having to learn the lines, only for that note to fall. And we get the hilarious scene with her and Mary desperately trying to get back to the, the cliff notes that she wrote, uh, or the cue card, and Alan not being aware what cue card means just starts to play up the cue, like just like thinks it's his cue to play up the tune and to really encourage this waltz that suddenly Mary and, and um, Mary and Katarina are doing much to Alan's confusion. And I thought that was really clever. Uh, but of course, like this puts Katarina in this position, right? So Maria's just like, what the hell's going on? And Katarina has to think on her feet. And she knows that she's supposed to be this evil stepsister. And the closest thing she can think of is Katarina from Fortune Lovers. So she actually just, because she played Fortune Lovers so so often, she knew the, the lines from Katarina. She sort of knew how she was, right? Tapped into her inner Katarina and just kind of made up the lines on the spot. 
And that was really clever. Like, it was cool to see her use her in-game knowledge in a way that we haven't seen before. Because that's her remembering what Katarina was like, remembering what she might have said, maybe even reciting dialogue, and then using it in the play to actually help her stick around. We even see the return of the council, right? The council of Katarina's just to try to help her through the play like and they were by the way the council was very much content to just chill out for the rest of existence but they get sort of thrust into this when you know the groups uh the uh, or the evil stepsister ends up twisting her ankle so they need somebody so the group you know calls on katarina and she actually is so impressive that Sophia definitely just thinks up a new ending on the spot. Definitely on the spot and not just because she wanted Nicole to get uh, some alone time. Or rather some one-on-one -on -one time. Because they ain't alone. But some one-on-one -on -one time with Katarina. Definitely made it up on the spot. Definitely didn't have that planned the whole time. Although that does lead to a really cute scene with Sophia being like just dismissing every other opinion like when someone's like i should be the black knight and she's like nope you can't possibly be nope you can't do that nope that would be silly but who, but oh but you're playing the music who would you know what i mean just completely dismissing it and being like by the way nicole you should be the black knight um which does actually lead to a very cool fight <laughs> i'm not gonna lie leads to a really interesting fight between uh gerald and nicole and keith i guess uh keith shows up mostly as comic relief but it is still cool to see him sort of engage in battle with uh gerald and nicole however uh i've said this before and i will say it again even the way nicole enters a scene and the way he delivers his lines is about as entertaining as watching paint dry <laughs> i think but that's the point of his character right like he's acted beautifully but the point of nicole as a character is to be boring right like that is like his character trope is that even though he's the pretty one, he's actually quite bland, right? It's almost a knock on visual novels, how, like, the pretty, prettiest one is kind of the most bland. <laughs> like, their their thing is that they are pretty. And you, you just see Nicole just sort of d deliver all his lines flatly. Although we do see that he actually is interested in Katarina, of course, like the rest of the harem. But you see, like, the three of them go to, go to war... Uh, to fight each other on stage and the other people on stage are like starting to get freaked out because it's really intense And I love that Mary's like they're all fighting for Katarina. I wish I could fight too <laughs> It's it's I honestly ship Mary and Katarina a hell of a lot. I'm not gonna lie um, But it, even when it comes to like the ships I think it's for me It was none of the people fighting like when it comes to the people I ship Katarina most with it's like Mary Maria Allen right like and then gerald but definitely last place is nicole and keith uh sophia is also another one that i ship with uh w with katarina as well but yeah nicole and keith ironically enough two of out, out of the three people actually fighting are the characters i feel like belong with her the least <laughs> and i really don't ship it at all um nicole just bores me to tears i know that, that but in a good way because that's his character and he's funny right when he shows up on screen He's about as engaging as, um, what's his name from School Rumble, you know? Just like, he's just kind of a bland character, and that's what makes him funny, right? Like, he's actually funny because he's so bland. And Keith is funny because he's so protective in a way that can, I know for some people, be annoying. I know some people who don't like Keith. For me, I find it funny, even though if it goes a little over the top with Keith sometimes. But the whole fight was great. The play itself was great. And again very very nostalgic for me definitely haven't been in that exact same situation but i have been in situations where you kind of have to like make up stuff on the spot and that's the beauty of being on stage my friends is uh improv and uh that's why people tell you to go to improv class because it can save your bacon in more than one occasion even when you're off stage improv class you should take it uh katarina clearly has been paying attention to her improv teacher but uh that's not the only thing that happens this week there is, in fact, some more stuff that we should probably get to, and that being the most important thing, this happens. Uh, so there is a rather interesting twist ending at the end of this, where in uh, what appears to be some girl shows up and sort of whisks Katarina away to the ball, even though nobody else is around. So Katarina is sort of just left to her own devices, I believe in like a dorm or somewhere behind uh, in like the backstage area of the play or something. Basically, everybody headed out to the ball, left Katarina there. And so they were waiting for one of their friends to bring her along. Um, and the show has been doing this thing where it's been like introducing characters as though they've always been there. <laughs> right? There's like two characters at the beginning of the play 
who they introduced as having always been there. Last week we had these two characters, or these three characters who showed up and were like Katarina's friends, but like we don't really know them. Um, it's th like they've been doing this thing where they're trying to establish the fact that like, yeah, like our main group is our main group, but they have like people they know outside of that. Uh, so there's this girl who shows up and was like, ah, oh, Katarina-sama, like I'll bring you along to the ball. Uh, everybody else is already there. So Katarina trusts this person enough to be like, all right, yeah, sure, let's go. And they head out. And then they just stop in the middle of the, the path when it's nice and dark. And I'm thinking like, Katarina, my girl, you have been kidnapped before. <laughs> I know that you know that this is dumb, but that is my girl, Bakarina. She ain't the brightest, but damn it, we love her anyway. So <laughs> they stop in the middle of the path. And of course, Katarina gets kidnapped because of course she does. Uh, Katarina is like the Daphne of, of villainess, but she gets knocked out and whoever it is, has to be taller than her based off the way that the hand is put up in front and the silhouette behind Katarina. They must be significantly taller than her, at least a head taller. And um, putting on my sleuthing glasses, there's only so far a character that I am aware of who is that much taller than Katarina that it could be. And that is that blue haired guy from the opening. Um, if you go back and watch the opening, you'll notice there's this long haired, uh, long blue haired individual who has to like crouch down to be at eye level with Katarina. So my guess is that it's that guy. And when we see him, he seems to be working with Sirius in that like magical whatever, <laughs> that magic, um, I forget what they even called it. The magic association of whatever the hell. Like basically magic police, <laughs> right? That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, so I assume that maybe it's actually that this ending is not meant to make you think that something scary is about to happen. Although I, I do think that that could also be it, but I wonder if maybe they're actually just trying to take her somewhere because they need to bring her into protective custody or something like that. I don't know, but I am assuming that it is the blue haired guy from the opening who does this. It could be the Yandere looking people from the OP as well, since we know that there is some scarier looking characters in the opening, but my money's on the blue haired character since the other characters look a bit smaller in stature. So I would actually guess it's the blue haired guy from the opening if I had to like just sh take a shot in the dark. Uh, now what this means, I don't know. I don't really know what this means because we don't know anything about the season yet. Like this could have something to do with the succession of the throne. And actually now that I'm saying it out loud, I wonder if maybe that's it. Cause we know that like she is connected to Alan and Gerald because they're like, you know, they're going to be leading the charge of like the, you know, they're going to be, well, not those two so much, but their older brothers are going to be in charge of like running their kingdom. So maybe they kidnapped Katarina in an attempt to sort of blackmail the, like maybe one, one brother's trying to blackmail the other, or maybe there's somebody else trying to blackmail the brothers as a group uh, to try to usurp control of the kingdom. I don't know. Um, now that I'm saying it out loud, maybe it's not the blue haired character. I was very confident about that, and now I no longer am. Oh, the beauty of not scripting these videos. I don't know. I'm very curious. I wonder what it could be. Well, because the thing is, a lot of things in the opening indicate that the magic people, right? Like the, the group of people who are in charge of magic. The magic association of whatever the hell. I don't know. The magic police guys. Magic force. Um, seemed to be taking a very prominent role, so I assumed we were getting more of a sort of like procedural type situation going on, but it seems as though we're still continuing a sort of overarching uh, villain of sorts like we had last season with Sirius, although Sirius is now working on the side of the angels um, alongside the magic whatever the hell. <laughs> so I assume that's what we were getting, but now I'm wondering if maybe this is going to have more to do with Gerald, Alan, and their brothers. Like maybe it's gonna actually be more about succession and stuff like that, which would also be really interesting. And again, it's not really what I expect, but that actually, you have to like remember that this is, this whole show is supposed to be like her living inside of an Otome game. And I think if that's the case, if we're living inside of a visual novel, that actually makes more sense to have the focus be on the brothers than it is on this magic police force group. It could be either way, I'm not super sure, but I'm definitely, definitely excited to find out more about what's going on with Katarina and, and what's going on with the general world building and all that stuff. It's, it's just a very interesting time. 
it's a very interesting tie when it comes to, to Villainess, and I, I absolutely love this show. I cannot wait for more. But, with that said, everybody, that is going to wrap up today's video here. So I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, don't forget to boop that up snoot. Share if you care. Leave a comment down below. And, of course, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell. Set notifications to all. And let all of AnyTube know that you're here. And, of course, before we go, as always, I want to give a big, big thank you to the good folks in the T-Squadron. Look at these beautiful people. Look at all these beautiful names. And, hey, if you'd like to join these beautiful people, there are two ways to do so. The first is by hitting that join button right beside the sub button. It gets you a badge next to your name, some emotes to spam in the comments, and of course your name scrolling past the screen here. Or you could check out that Patreon link in the description for just a single dollar. You can help keep this channel afloat, and I would sincerely appreciate it. So, once again, a big thank you to the good folks in the T-Squadron. And that is pretty much it for me. Again, uh, if you guys were curious about what's going on with uh, the channel and my eventual shift in vocabulary and tone, uh, you will have to wait until the re-debut uh, on the Twitch channel, probably sometime in the next few weeks to a month. Uh, and I will post a video letting you guys know when that's happening. Until then, videos as usual. Don't expect uh, anything out of the ordinary from me for the next few weeks. And then... Things are going to change, but it's still going to be me talking about anime. It's still going to be me. Don't freak out. I'm not going anywhere. But for now, bye!